Thank you, Ray, for the very warm welcome, and uh, to Lucy and Chris as well, who were there to welcome me on what is my uh, first outdoor gig that I am uh, doing. So uh, a little bit nervous. I know I have big shoes to fill in my predecessor, Christina McKelvey, um, who, in my opinion, did an awesome job. Um, but uh, you know, I'd like to reassure her and to yourselves that hopefully it's in a safe pair of hands with someone who. Who, um, is deeply, deeply committed uh, to culture and all the other bits of my portfolio, which I can't quite get used to that when people say that still. I'd also like to uh, give a wee shout out to the people that are listening online as well. It's wonderful that we can have um, a hybrid meeting where people are in the room and you can hear the chat, but hopefully up and down the country and maybe even across the world, there are people joining us online um, that will also benefit uh, from the conversations that will take place uh, today. So. It is good to be here to speak to you at this event and to take a little bit of time to look back at the first year of the strategy for Scotland's museums and galleries. And as the new Minister for Culture, Europe and International Development, there you go, got it. Um, I want to thank you uh, for being here and for all the hard work that has taken place over the last year to get to where we are today. Um, I'm pleased that the Scottish Government has supported the development of the second strategy for Scotland's museums. The strategy's vision is to ensure a valued and resilient sector which is accessible to all, creating a fairer and more sustainable Scotland. And I look forward to working with you to continue to make this happen because I'm fully aware that it is a journey that we are on. Today's event is about sharing the collective knowledge uh, that we have gained, the good practice that we have put in place, and building and developing our partnership so we can learn from and support each other in a truly collaborative way. Whilst there have been encouraging rises in visitor levels for some, it has undoubtedly been a difficult year for most as we continue to face the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic and the challenging financial context. We also face the existential crisis of climate change and, of course, unstable geopolitics. This is why Scotland's museums and gallery strategy is incredibly important. The mission set out in the strategy provides a shared sense of mission and inspiration across the three strands of resilience, connection and workforce. It provides an important roadmap of priorities designed to help support the sector as it builds its resilience and helps us seek out opportunities to ensure the continued success and relevance of the sector. I'm all for one for celebrating successes where we have them, and sometimes it feels like they're few and far between, but we must grasp them. And this event makes it clear that museums and galleries are at the heart of Scotland's cultural offering, strengthening the inclusivity, the environmental sustainability, and economic development. The diversity and impressive wealth of heritage and culture that we have in Scotland is represented in everything that this sector offers to the people of Scotland and so many who visit our wonderful country. The Scottish Government recognises and champions the significant impact that culture can have on our local communities. And this is why the connection strand of this strategy is so important, ensuring that we can deliver equality of access for everyone is essential. Museums should be places which are as inclusive and as accessible as possible. Museums and galleries give people an insight into their world and culture and its objects tell many fascinating stories. Some of these stories present more complex and challenging aspects. The work that we are doing together on the Empire and Slavery in Scotland's Museum is an important example of how this can be done, as Ray mentioned earlier. 
The Scottish Government is proud to be actively anti-racist and Scotland is determined to play our part in eradicating racism, inequality and injustice and in building a better and fairer world. And it's no better time to actually reiterate that than what is going on currently um, in some narratives, in some spheres. But this cannot be done alone. Um, and it must be done with the support of the sector as well. And I thank you in advance and um, for the support that you have given the uh, anti-racist work in the past as well. And of course, the workforce are at the heart of everything that we do. And ensuring a skilled and diverse workforce is crucial to the future needs of and the resilience of the sector. I look forward to hearing the lessons learned and the successes around fair work, diversity and skills development. Of course, given the current cost of living challenges and the tough financial situation that we are in, we have to prior, uh, prioritise actively to create a more resilience, um, resilient and sustainable sector. And I look forward to working with you all in order to do this. I would also like to take a moment to recognise the key role that Museums Gallery Scotland plays in supporting the museum sector in Scotland and to thank them for the work that they continue to do. Lucy and her team do a fantastic job in ensuring that they understand the challenges and the opportunities that you all face and continue to work in partnership with the Scottish Government in order to advance that. I would like to conclude by expressing my thanks to those at Museum Gallery Scotland who have organised this event and to everyone here today for your enthusiasm, commitment and support for Scotland's cultural sector. I look forward to speaking to all of you in the future and to learn more about how we can bring our history and culture alive to even more new audiences as we move forward. Thank you. Winners, thank you so much uh, for making us your first gig. We're, we're really privileged to have you here today. Um, you show us great understanding and empathy for the work we're trying to do, understanding what we're, what we're, what we're the value of what museums in, in Scotland are trying to do and also some of the challenges that we're facing. So thank you for that. Um, I'm Lucy Castle. I'm the Chief Executive of Museums Gallery Scotland. Um, just as a visual description, I'm a white woman with short, curly, greying hair, I'm sad to say. Um, I have glasses currently in the top of my head and I'm wearing a jacket that I was going to go green-blue, but there's been, I've asked the team today what colour my jacket is. I've not had the same answer twice. So, you know, you can all vote on that later. Anyway, thank you, Minister. I'm just going to ask um, a very... A, 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 a few questions um, which have been sourced partly from the survey that we did to the sector as to, to what people would like to hear about. So um, I want to start by asking you what about your own experience in museums and galleries. I know that you've got fantastic museums and galleries in your own constituency, but what do you um, see as the value? What's your hope for the sector going forward? Um, well, I'm happy to talk about the hope um, because there is much to be hopeful for. Um, but uh, to also sort of give a wee visual description as a wee Pakistani woman um, that was born in Sangoy, a tiny, tiny little place, um, coming over uh, when she was six and then arriving in Scotland when um, she was 16. And uh, her salvation was actually the Kelvin Grove Art Galleries. Um, having been, you know, I come from an incredibly modest uh, background um, and these sort of very impressive uh, Victorian austere buildings, um, not only the, the memories of the empire and the impact of that upon my own family, but they were always places that weren't for the likes of me. Um, and uh, not having any money for even bus fare actually forces you uh, to walk. And I did all the way from the south side. Um, and I discovered all these amazing free places that I was brave enough to actually open the door. And when I opened that door and that land of discovery that, you know, you, you have no money, um, you're in a land that you just think, you know, you've moved here, your parents have made that choice. And then suddenly, to have the world open up to you um, and to be able to visit each little section and because it was free you could come as often as you wanted 
Um, and it's like books for some people. I love books too, but for me, these spaces, and that's why now I am so utterly dedicated to making sure that they are accessible and open and relevant um, to the diverse nation that we have. Um, because as we welcome people in, we're welcoming their stories. And where best are these stories told? But through the artifacts, through the building heritage of our museums and galleries in Scotland in particular. So I'm very lucky to have amazing places. And my hope is actually building on your key themes that you have, is to actually build on those um, and to make sure that it is resilient so we don't ever lose that for the next generation. Um, I went on to be a teacher for 30 years, and uh, maybe in, in, a, in another question I can tell you a wee funny story about some visits uh, of kids that I have brought here. But yeah, my hope is that it remains open, accessible, inclusive, um, and uh, relevant for the future. Thank you, Minister. It's so important to hear those experiences and it really reminds us of, of the importance of, of the work that we're doing to, um, to make those connections, make our museums as accessible as they can possibly be and, and, and the, the impact that we can have on, on individuals and on communities through our work. So just moving on, uh, sort of building on that a little bit, thinking about, we know all these um, social impacts that museums can have right across different areas of, of, of national outcomes. We've talked quite a lot about... Um, cross-portfolio working and the potential for culture to engage at a sort of departmental level within government. Mm. What do you see as the most profitable, or how can we take that forward? What areas of cross-portfolio working across government do you think we would be good for us to take forward in the next few years? Um, well, I'm going to be biased um, because we can't help but bring our biases. We, we know all about that um, and to be in touch with them. Uh, however, I'm proud of my biases towards education. I always will be. Um, I think that uh, health uh, um, is also very important and I always think of health as something um, in, in this context of culture. Um, I look at health as sort of like, you know, the, the beating heart, the blood that runs through and all the, the functionality and the mechanisms. And if we think of education um, as the mind, of sort of like feeding the mind, and then with that other sort of like, you know, the, the perfect triangle for me is then the culture, which I see as the soul. And within that, so if you've got the heart, you've got the mind, and you've got the soul, between those three, I think that actually working across those, we could truly innovate there. Um, I mean, there's amazing work that's already going on. I know this, um, having been a teacher, um, having taken many children to uh, visit museums and galleries, but actually being very impressed with the offering that they do and how that ties in with the curriculum that we have and how it supports it, brings it alive, um, tells the stories, but also inspires and challenges our young people's thinking for the future so they can innovate for the future. So whilst we're trying to encourage them to do that, the challenge is also on us to actually uh, come out of our silos and to be brave. It requires bravery. Mm -hmm. One thing I find is everybody tells me, I wish we could come out of our silos, I think that would be really good. And then if I turn around and challenge that and say, right, okay, what are we gonna do? Oh yeah, but not us, because we're fine, we're, we're fine. Um, so I think it's that next step, and it is, there's a bit of discomfort there, um, but that's okay. Mm -hmm. It's okay to be discomfort, you know, to sit in that space. Because if you're in that bit where you're thinking, actually, I'm a bit uncomfortable here, I'm a bit at sea, I embrace that and think, well, that's where innovation will take place. So with the health and the education, and I couldn't even put a price on the impact on health and well-being, on mental health, um, skills development, uh, knowledge, capacity, all of these things that w we need. We need them now, and we're certainly going to need them in the future. That's, that's great to hear. And I think there are a lot of people in the sector keen to do that brave thing. And, and I suppose it's what we look forward to working with you in terms of how we can maybe facilitate those connections that we can make together, because I think there's real potential there. Well, um, I'm your girl. <laughs> <laughs> Great, look forward to that. I was going to end by just asking, and you've touched on it a couple of times, um, your background uh, as, a, as a teacher. Um, education is one of the strands of our strategy. 
Um, so I just wonder if you've got any thoughts on what the sort of new areas that education is going into, progressive change, maybe anti-racist education, early years, attainment, that you want to talk a little bit about where yeah. we seem to make that difference. I mean, it, it is so wide, um, but I suppose from my personal experience, what, the, the biggest change that I've seen, um, and we're accelerating that, uh, is the anti-racist work. Um, and uh, the theme of discomfort, again, um, we celebrate diversity in Scotland. We're very proud of that. And uh, we, uh, I, I think we have a, an incredibly positive narrative on it. But what we need to do now is to actually push ourselves a little bit further and to make sure that not only our policies match that rhetoric and that welcoming narrative, but also we need to put our money where our mouth is in that sense. Um, and the excellent work that's going on at the Hunterian, and actually um, I think that was uh, Christina McKelvey was the minister speaking at that event and I attended as the local MSP. Um, so uh, whilst there can always be more uh, financial assistance with that, I do think we've made an excellent start. Um, there's been a tons of work obviously, years of work that have got us into that place. But I'm not one that would say, you know, sort of like take away the statues or this, that, and the next thing. I think it is important to recognize our history and to recognize that there are multiple stories and there are different views and different lenses. And I think that we do that, but what we possibly don't do so much is to actually put that equality across that, that those different lenses and those different viewpoints have equal value and they will be different. And that requires some of us to challenge our own thinking, to challenge uh, historical set narratives. And how can we best do that? We can do that through our museums and galleries. We can do it through our artwork that are, you know, the, the, mag it's the, the Hello Magazine version, you know, all the portraits of the past. Um, I know that here, for instance, and I did actually get to come to it when it was the Kabuki Festival of the, the Japanese sort of like art that took place. Um, I lived in Edinburgh for many years and brought children here on many an occasion. And I remember that because we were looking at portraits and when you have a child in your class that sort of like sees images that they recognize themselves in, they are then connected, their family is then connected, and they then put in an investment for the future, and that's what we need, is we need our population to be invested, to be totally committed, because then we can go on that journey together, and the potential that we have for keeping our museums and galleries alive is, is untapped in that sense. So the more people that connect to it, the better. And we're better to start than with our children. Um, as I came in earlier, uh, it's controversial, uh, but I uh, did uh, remember when there was originally, there was the pond. Um, and in those days, there were even <laughs> fish in the pond. And I mentioned it and somebody said, oh, very controversial, <laughs> lots of debates. And I thought, do you know what? But museums and galleries, they should be controversial. They should be making us think. They should be taking us out, again, of our comfort zone so that we can evolve. And, you know, in some people's heads, there still is that stuffy image of, like, these places are not for us. But actually, they are. And it will be one of the missions that I've made for myself is that, you know, I've got two years until the next election. Who knows what happens then? But uh, until that point, I've definitely, I've already rolled up my sleeves. You can see that. Um, and get stuck in and to make sure that it is relevant, it's connected, it's resilient, and it is supported. And I hope that you do feel supported because you do have my support and my thanks. Thank you, Minister. Well What a brilliant rallying cry. Thank you so much, Minister, for that. I'm so looking forward to the conversations. So many strands there for us to pick up. Um, we're going to pick up the next one. Uh, thank you. I think you'll be able to stay and listen to this um, next discussion. We've got three people from the sector we want to sort of hear about um, who can give an overview of some of the, some of the things that the, the sector are experiencing at the moment. Um, so I'd really like to welcome to the stage, the, the front anyway, um, our three panellists for this morning who are Gillian Finlay, who is the president of the Museums Association, Konya Huff, who is the president of the Scottish Museums 
Federation. And am I getting this right? And David Mann, who is chair of Industrial Museum Scotland. And they can each provide a different um, perspective, um, as well as those roles. Jill works in the lo local authority. Connor in a new independent museum. Do, do, do walk while I talk. <laughs> and, and David from one of our national industrials. So a range of different perspectives there. I'm um, change my title. I might be president as well. I know. We're in great, uh, awesome company here. So thank you all for, for joining us. What we're going to do, um, and we don't have a, a huge amount of time, but I've asked you each to give sort of five minutes of an overview of what you think of the issues that are facing the sector at the moment and some of the opportunities. Uh, and then uh, we'll have a bit of a discussion afterwards about some common themes. And Jill, I'm going to ask you to kick us off, if that's okay. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much. Lucy, and um, a real pleasure to hear from the Minister. What, a, what an inspiring and um, motivating way to start the morning. It's been fantastic to hear your vision for our sector, um, and I'm confident we can respond. Um, I'm a, a woman with uh, white skin, shoulder-length hair and glasses. Um, I'm also greying. I'm not sure how this has happened to us, but also greying. Um, I'm wearing a black tunic dress and a sage green um, fluffy cardi type wraparound thing. I use she and her pronouns. Um, I'm really delighted to be part of this panel session today. It's a privilege to be here with Kwanya, with David and with you Lucy and it's always inspiring to catch up with colleagues who are working with communities and in museums around Scotland even over coffee. Um, uh, there's already so much um, exciting news that I'm hearing from colleagues everywhere so I'm looking forward to a full day of this. It feels really timely to have this session, um, as Ray has touched on and Lucy as well, a year into the new strategy. It completely makes sense, of course, to, to pause and to reflect on how it's working for our sector as the world continues to throw up large, huge new challenges and epic change. It's also an election year for the UK government, so a crucial advocacy opportunity too for our sector. Um, and a chance on days like this to collaborate and to articulate together both the achievements that our sector continues to make despite the difficult economic environment, but also to highlight the potential we have to achieve more, to progress Scottish government outcomes, um, and to work in a cross-portfolio way, especially, as has been touched on already, where culture so readily connects with other areas where we positively impact people's lives on a daily basis, such as health, communities, and education. Revisiting the strategy and its priorities ahead of uh, this session today, I'm again struck by the synergy it has with the work that the Museums Association is doing through its campaigns, through its CBD programmes and events, and not least uh, a flagship campaign, which I hope is familiar to everybody here, Museums Change Lives, which showcases the huge variety of work that museums um, are doing everywhere to foster and enable positive, sustainable change in our local communities. Um, under this banner, there are some fabulous case studies from Scottish museums on the website. Um, do take a look if you're not familiar with it. It's there along with our museum's manifesto and advocacy resources uh, for everyone to use, calling for increased investment in the sector if it is to continue to achieve the transformational work and have the social impact that all of us in this room are regularly witness to. But there are other specific areas of work which align, which I want to touch on just briefly. I started my term as MA president in 2021 when COVID and the effects of lockdown still held all of us in its grip. So perhaps not surprisingly, a focus on well-being has felt absolutely essential. Individual, community and organisational health are interlinked. And when the stresses of the cost of living crisis exacerbate the challenges that we face post-pandemic, it's crucial that this issue remains high on the shared agenda that we have. The climate crisis raises another set of very specific issues and concerns for museums, many of us housed in historic buildings. And the challenge of achieving net zero, being equipped to change our buildings, our practice and our behaviours to make sure our sector becomes part of the solution for climate justice and not part of the problem, is one that concerns us all. And of course, the pandemic highlighted the systemic inequalities that pervade every sphere of life in this country. And at the MA, our work to champion fair pay and conditions for staff and to encourage organisational awareness and development in this area continue to be a priority. 
The latest version of our salary guidelines were published last year. Our anti-racism essentials course will be updated this year, specifically to cover anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. We're currently recruiting for steering group members to support and develop our anti-racism and decolonization work. And next week, we will be asking for applications from you, from museums around Scotland and ar across the UK, who may want to participate in our late an latest anti-racism programme. And that clearly aligns with the fantastic programme which MGS is running now, Delivering Change, which builds specifically on anti-oppressive principles to create a more equitable sector and a fairer society. So there's much for museums to do and in extremely restricted financial circumstances. But as well as resilience and uh, workforce, the strategy talks to the importance of collaboration and partnership in all its guises feels more important than ever for our sector if we are to meet and achieve our common goals. So I really look forward to hearing from all of you about how we can progress that today. Thank you. Thank you, John. I'm going to resist any follow-up questions until the end, but uh, we can go to Konya. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Kwanya Huff. I am a dark-skinned um, brown woman with a smile that dazzles, I've heard. <laughs> <laughs> I have black hair and I'm wearing glasses, a purple top and a lovely like black and white jacket that my mom bought for me for Christmas. So I am the president of Scottish Museum Federation. If you don't know what that is, it's an organization that's over 80 years old and we have members that are several hundred members that represent volunteers, students, and museum professionals all throughout Scotland, except for Highland and Islanders. We can use more of you. Please join. <laughs> and so I'm going to talk a bit about that role and really the workforce. I joined the Federation as a committee member. We're all um, volunteer committee members that do the work in 2020. And as you would know, what was happening in 2020, a lot of isolation, a lot of uncertainty, and that kind of carry through, I became president in 2021. And from there, I got a chance to meet a lot of people, some people in this room, and just really talk to everyone about what they were feeling, what they were going through. So our first conference that we did, when things opened back up, was we're focused on the workforce. And that was all about providing resources and just networking opportunities and just trying to make people feel less alone and that you know there should be a focus on our mental well-being and our development and things like that. I'd say a special thanks to MGS because they did create a lovely resource for us for HR and well-being that's still on our website for people and that's currently being updated as well. And so looking at the strategy and having workforce be a massive highlight just makes sense because we well, we all know this, we're very important. You have buildings, you have objects, but without the people that take care of it, that interpret it, that looks after it, then you just have buildings and objects. You can't you know, connect with the community. You can't bring them in if your workforce is feeling undervalued and not respected and just concerned about just where they are. You know, There are a lot of stresses, financial, lots of cuts happening. So you might feel particularly middle management that you might be seeing the living wage rise, however, your actual like inflation each year, maybe not rising so much. So we do hear a bit about that, and I'm really interested in the workshops and sessions happening later today, which are addressing and offering real change and real development that should hopefully try to combat some of these issues, because I will say that it does feel like a privilege to work in museums. It's a lovely place to work, but you also need to be respected and remunerated appropriately for that work, and that's really important to say. And along those lines, also, my job as visitor experience team leader for the Museum of Scottish Fire Heritage, we are an independent museum, we have a trust, but I also work for the Scottish Fire Service, and I would say this strategy has been great because I'm working in a national body, which, as you can imagine, have a very, very, um, tailored focus on what they do. It's you know fire safety prevention. We're part of the prevention team. And we've been able to go with this strategy and say, we align up. Our, our goals are the, actually the same. We're looking to communicate with vulnerable people. We're looking to make them safe. We're looking to bring in different audiences. I'm very fortunate that our topic is amazing and that you know we kids come in with Nina's and also like adults and stuff and everyone's excited and I'm equally excited with them because I'm like bring on like the fire trucks and so 
but I would say that, but before, before we had the strategy and we were just kind of saying, how does this all mesh up? I did go, we could go through now and say to the officers and stuff, we can work together. We can go with the community safety engagement team. We have a natural place that the audience wants to come. And I think that could be said about a lot of museums. People volunteer their time to come to you. And so you are a place that people want to be at and you are a place that naturally can align with other organizations and other government strategies. And I think that it, that's just great. So that's really all I have to say. <laughs> Thank you, Konya. David, over to you. Ah, uh, this is the worst bit. White male, <laughs> grey hair, grey face, grey suit. I managed to find a purple <laughs> shirt so it didn't affect that, change that. Uh, uh, he, him, uh, and pleased to be here today. This is my first trip to Edinburgh since uh, the pandemic. Uh, my first conference since the pandemic. Uh, so thank you for being part of my therapy. <laughs> and David Mann, last 10 years, I've been director at the Scottish Maritime Museum and for most of that time been chairman of the uh, Industrial Museum Scotland, IMS. IMS is 15 members, some associates, some full members. And oh, th through our collective membership, we have everything from fire engines to lifeboats to mines to townships to you could keep going and keep going and keep going. Grady listed buildings by the, the ton uh, to look after. I think the, what I've written down here is planes, trains, automobiles, and boats. Lots of boats. Expensive boats. <laughs> Historically important boats that we can't afford to keep uh, is the problem. But on today's, one of today's themes, collaboration. IMS is one of the most successful collaborations and partnerships in the museum sector. Nothing like blowing your own trumpet for a change. Uh, we run several projects. Uh, we're currently running Powering Our People. We're upskilling and training uh, people in a variety of conservation skills. Uh, uh, working on engines, working on boats, working on models, working on paper, going through all of that. We're doing work exchange, workplace exchange visits here. Uh, we've had people at the museum, we've had people uh, at Dundee and all over the place. It's been great. Uh, and we do that as part of our collaboration. But as a grouping, we also work uh, in advocacy. We work hard with MGS, with Scottish Government. Uh, we're great to have contact with them uh, through their support uh, and working through that. And we deliver pastoral care for the directors. Directors are very lonely people. <laughs> Nobody comes and speaks to the director and puts a hand around their shoulder and says, how are you today? Uh, so we met together and during the pandemic, we were meeting on a weekly basis uh, where there was support for that so that we could discuss, uh, raise our concerns, uh, talk about funding uh, and hopefully see people through uh, the pandemic and its aftermath. Uh, the aftermath is the worrying bit. There's particular pressure at the moment on medium-sized museums as part of IMS. Uh, this size of museum is struggling to be resilient, struggling to be sustainable, uh, trying to cope with delivering everything that we currently deliver, the education, the, the help and support, the community engagement. Uh, you all know what we deliver. You keep delivering it, we keep delivering it. And we need to keep doing that but we can't keep doing it if we're not funded to do it. And there are several museums out there of a reasonable size that are in real, real concerns about them going forward and, and keeping to go forward. And there needs to be important discussions about how we support them, how we keep going with them. And part of me being here today is to raise that, that issue. As I said, despite that, we do fantastic work in education, community empowerment, wealth and well-being education, STEM, employment skills, training, development, apprenticeships, intangible cultural heritage. We run a boat building school. Uh, we work through all of that. We have some fantastic partnerships. We partner with uh, the Imperial War Museum, Manchester Science Museum, Greenwich Maritime Museum, National Historic Ships, GEM, Maritime Museum's part of a, a 15 museum pilot uh, with GEM at the moment, uh, looking at how we can bring health and culture and well-being into education and work through that. We work with the Nationals, uh, speaking to Sam earlier this morning. Uh, we work with the galleries, we work with the MGS, local authorities. Uh, personally, local authorities have been fantastic. And I'm not saying that because Rona's sitting there. Uh, we get great support from the local authorities. Uh, we've done reasonably well after the pandemic. That's through support from the local authority. 
helping us engage with our local community, work with our local community, develop our local community, make us more resilient by having that community support. Uh, we host major events. We had a weekend where we had 8,000 people through our doors uh, in one weekend for a, a food and craft fair that was supported by our local authority and two neighbouring local authorities as well, who we don't even ha have units in or sites in. But sustainability, resilience, and in some cases, survival are the key focuses that my members are looking at just now. And that we have to deliver on that while we're delivering the real living wage, fair work, while we're investing in apprentices, trainees, and placements. Uh, and we need to keep doing that because, in my opinion, and in my members' opinion, there's a lack of talent out there at the moment. We're leaking talent out the sector. It's more difficult to replace, particularly at a senior management level, to find people. It might be that people are applying, but the short lists are getting shorter. The, uh, the quality might be there, but it's harder to find. And we need to make sure that we're bringing that through from the bottom and bring it out through the top so that we can deliver that. As museums, we deliver so much more than collections. We contribute to tourism, health, economy. I think, it, I think and some, there's nobody here to correct me, I don't think. Industrial museums deliver 20 million to local and national economy uh, through 15 medium-sized to small museums. Uh, so the cross-portfolio working that we talked about earlier, we need to continue to look at how we deliver that. We need to find the value in what we do, and we need to make sure others value what we do and are willing to contribute to what we do to make us resilient, to make us sustainable, and to make sure we're here in three years, five years, ten years. Thank you. Gosh, thank you all so much. Um, the, we've heard so many um, ideas and, pers and perspectives really important about what museums can achieve, what we're capable of doing if we're resourced to do it, uh, but also those very real pressures that there are. Um, we're quite tight for time, but I'm going to one topic that I'd just like to explore with you. We've all talked about um, collaboration in, in different ways, um, and um, it's one of the things that came out of the survey as well, of things that people have ambitions to do more of. But I'm also conscious that you know, when partnership works, it works brilliantly, but also when it it doesn't always deliver what you anticipate. And there's an investment that's required to develop those partnerships, sometimes to the degree of, of risk about that, as to whether you're going to get out what you need. And, and so at the moment, in particular, it can be challenging to find that time to try the new thing and be, do the innovative thing. So maybe, could you just talk a little bit about what makes the best partnerships in, in your experience? And, and I might just encourage David, I also think you've got so many, you've talked about so many partnerships, but also to think about partnerships outside of our museum sector, because I think that's where some of that comes from, is working with others as well. But Jill, do you just want to just, sure. you've got a great example of what? Sure. Um, so uh, I think first and foremost, shared values, being really, really clear about what we have in common, um, having shared goals, understanding each other's expectations, making sure that that is realistic, having clearly defined roles and responsibilities for each partner, I think helps. Honesty, I think is crucial. Good communication when things are going wrong, being <sighs> courageous, being able to say this isn't working. Let's look again uh, and let's change course if needs be. And th that courage to call out problems and to, to review failure and to value failure too in order to make the next um, proposal more successful I think is really key. I would challenge the idea that partnership needs to be extraneous, needs to be additional. I think the way that we can make it work and the way that we can mainstream it is to build it into the work that we do. Mm -hmm. Um, and as you're speaking, Lucy, what occurs to me, and touching on, uh, the Minister referenced it too, the, the, the current um, appetite and work across Scotland that's going on to explore and reevaluate our local and national connections with the history of slavery and colonialism. Um, here in Edinburgh, I'm very fortunate to uh, be in a position to support the independent um, slavery and colonialism review implementation group, which has picked up where Sir Jeff Palmer left off with the review. Um, and is looking to work in collaboration with public partners, with private commercial partners, with academia, with our national cultural organisations to really un understand the part that we all have to play and the way that we can help to address the issues that are still felt by our communities today as a result of that legacy. Um, that work should not and cannot happen in isolation. It has to happen with a wide range of partners and collaboration in its widest form. And for me, it's been 
uh, a real lesson in understanding how the best partnerships will always be learning partnerships. You will always come out of those knowing more, understanding better the world that we live in uh, if it's gone well than we did when we went in. Great, thank you. Really, really thoughtful. And yeah, I, lot that chimes with, with ideas that I have as well. So that, that's, that's, that's good to hear. Conny, your, your um, conference coming up, uh, shout out to your conference, is on collaboration, I think. What are you hoping to get out of that event? It's our conference, which is in April. <laughs> and it's um, a little help from the sector, and it's all about collaboration and resources and examples of how people are joining together, where, whether it be internally with other museums and galleries or external. And it's really great. We have a lot of submissions and things from actually organizations that we never thought would even um, would, would be wanting to present, but they are branching out and coming to the cultural sector to, in order to be able to fulfill their, you know, their goals and ours as well. So I think what we want to get out of it was to say that coming out of the pandemic, coming out of all the uncertainty that we're not alone, that there are other people that we can work with that share our goals and that it doesn't have to be, you know, it doesn't have to feel so stressful that it can, as just mentioned, be natural. Like our museum is currently working with the Museum of Edinburgh and it just kind of happened in a natural way. You know, they, we have our 200th anniversary. They have a lot of fire stuff that I love to get my hands on. <laughs> and so it just kind of happened. And in the, mean, in the process, we're also developing our volunteer and our um, kind of emerging professional staff along the way because they're actually the ones that are leading it along with the support of the curator and myself. So I do think that we just wanted to give more examples and encourage people that you might want to achieve the things in the strategy. You might think, how can I do it? And that you don't have to do it alone. I think that's really helpful, Konya, to, and, and the idea of building it in. I think within the sector, we've always been really good at naturally partnering and, and identifying those opportunities. I think the sector is very generous, actually, with each other in terms of, of spotting those opportunities and, and sharing um, skills and experience. And I suppose it is just that when you're trying to keep the doors open, the lights on, then, then it starts to get, get you know, but it is the right thing to do. It can deliver far more than, than you put in if, it, if, it's, if you can find those shares values and, and base it in that. David, you've, you've been doing some amazing work with the Maritime Museum in, in museums as, as um, key partners, I think, in, in some regeneration work. And I think that's just, could you just maybe, do you want to just speak a little bit about how do you, if we're part of those wider regeneration programs, growth deals, what's, what's the yeah. experience there? Don't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, having just signed an MOU with North Ayrshire Council and Ayrshire Economic Growth Deal, uh, for a, hopefully a 10 million pound development in Irvine Harbour side. Uh, it's a lot of work, it's a lot of partnership and you've got to make sure that you are, the goals are aligned and that everybody, as Jill says, everybody's working towards the same aim. Uh, another point Jill made was that the, the partnerships, what we do, I don't, I struggle sitting here trying to think of something that we've done in the last three or four years that we haven't partnered with somebody be that in the sector, be that out of the sector, be that local authority. Th they're all done in partnership. Our education programs done in partnership with a couple of trusts. Uh, we provide free buses, it's great. Uh, but we still can't get schools to come, Minister, strangely. Uh, all of our community engagement work is done with the local authority and several community groups, New Scots, uh, the LGBT community, the Polish community, uh, and we work with them in partnership with them. So virtually everything that we deliver uh, uh, looking at what we need to do is partnership to get somebody to look after our collection as well and that would be a great way to go forward especially the boats but it, it, it's key the, but the, there has to be and I think it was my education officer said the other day there that we she had a meeting with somebody and, and I said is this going further and she said no and I said why not I says I don't think they see our value in this project uh, and you have to you, you can't partnership for partnership's sake there's got to be a value in it for the museum uh, you've got to make sure it's not a drain in resources, that it's developing the museum, that's making you more sustainable and resilient going forward. Uh, and you've got to make sure that that's what happens. When every partnership goes through, go through the detail, go through the action plan, go through the, the responsibilities and make sure it all happens. Thank you, David. Thank you all. Um, I, this is a conversation that could go on and on, but I'm, we're actually already over time. So I think we'll just need to let the conversation continue over the, over the, the, next, the next stage. Um, but thank you all so much for sharing your thoughts this morning. Thank you again, Minister, for um, joining us this morning. And I hope that that was useful, just hearing some of those, those views from the sector. And if we can just thank Ray, the Minister, and our panellists again. Thank you. <laughs>
Right, so I start, I think, uh, sorry? It's nearly tea time. <laughs> it, it's very nearly tea time. I'm, I'm moving over here just to, to allow you to, um, if you want to go back to your seats, but I am the last thing before tea. I just want to, to say a few things about, um, about uh, what's coming next for the rest of the day. Um, so before we break for those, those refreshments, there are going to be three sessions from here on, um, one that will take us up till lunch and two more this afternoon. And each of those is going to be a main session here in this room and a workshop. And then we're going to come together at the end of the day to reflect what we've learned. And you've been able to pick up um, a printed copy of the programme or to scan a QR code to access it on your phone at the registration desk. If you've missed that, there are QR codes that you can scan and some printed programmes up in the collaboration space where you're having your tea and coffee this morning. Um, there's also up there the sessions and workshops you've signed up to um, are going to be listed up there. The rooftops is where the workshops will take place. Now, for those of you that know the building, that's where the old tower restaurant used to be. So it's a bit of a walk, we'll, um, but uh, you get to go through the museum, which is fantastic. Brilliant views from up there. So it's a lovely space for, for the workshop. Um, we recommend you leave about five minutes to get there. Um, and for those of you attending the first session after the coffee break, if you take the lift or the stairs down to level one to the where the registration desk was, there'll be two members of MGS staff wearing purple lanyards who can take you across and they'll be able to continue to do that through the day if you're not quite sure where that is. So just as it's a busy program, please do make sure you leave enough time to get between those sessions. Uh, the MGS team are all wearing purple lanyards and are happy to help with any questions you have today. Uh, we have provided uh, accessibility information about the venue, but if you have any other questions or need any support, please speak to any member of staff. Um, the sessions and workshops are facilitated by a hand-picked group of inspiring speakers from both within and from outside the sector, and they've been developed in response to the feedback we have received from you on our sector survey um, in December. Um, we're really pleased to hear 85% of you say you're either very satisfied or satisfied with the work that MGS do on your behalf, which is really heartening for us. But your feedback continues to be so important in shaping our work, and we'll continue to ensure following today that we consult with you regularly and strategically on what areas of need you have that we can help with. Up in the collaboration space, there's also a feedback station for in-person attendees to share your work and your experiences. Let us know how you're getting on with the strategy, how your work contributes to the overall collective aims. So please do come and have a chat with us. We're really keen to find out about the great variety of work that's happening in the sector. We don't always know what's going on out there, and we want to be able to share that through our um, advocacy work on your behalf and through our newsletters and so on. So what are the opportunities and challenges you see ahead? Your feedback enables us to boost the range of activity that we platform through our knowledge exchange activity and advocacy. It will also help us to identify any important gaps that we need to consider as your national development body. For online attendees, you'll be able to feedback an online link, and that link will also be made available to both online and in-person delegates. So we are going to pause for some refreshments and a chance to connect. The, there are other stands in the collaboration space where you'll find MGS colleagues who are keen to talk to you about apprenticeships, skills development, grants programs, the Delivering Change Project, and more. And you'll also find a range of organisations who can support you in your work. These include the Association for Scottish Visitor Attractions, the Association of Cultural Enterprises, Museums Association, the Association of Independent Museums, that's a lot of associations, uh, Make Your Mark, the Volunteer Campaign, and the National and International Partnerships team here at National Museum Scotland. So please do pop by for a chat with them and find out more about how they can support you in the work that you do. So the sessions here in auditorium and in rooftops begin at 11.35. The session on inclusion takes place in this room, focusing on the next steps for the sector arising from the Empire Slavery in Scotland's Museum's recommendations. And up in rooftops, a creel full of climate, climate action, intangible cultural heritage, and museums and galleries. That's taking place, I say, over in the rooftops. I'm looking forward to speaking to as many as delegates here today as possible. I know the MGS team is too. Now you can have your coffee, and I hope you enjoy your day. Thank you.